Thank you. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, IPSC, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming tonight. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor uh, uh, to be speaking to you. Um, what I'll do is, um, is, is speak about uh, the ongoing uh, uh, genocide uh, against our friends, people, and family in Gaza, 2.3 million Palestinians uh, in the besieged and occupied uh, uh, territory uh, that, as, as we speak, uh, uh, are still facing a genocide uh, where uh, Israel is killing people uh, in the hundreds on daily basis, uh, pushing uh, uh, hundreds of thousands into deliberate starvation and, and famine. Um, and this despite uh, uh, calls all across the globe, including well, yesterday from the UN Security Council uh, for, for a ceasefire. And what I want to do is, um, is try to understand together uh, this genocide uh, and therefore uh, understand what we can do to best confront it, stop it, and ensure that it never uh, happens again. And to do that, um, what I do is speak about, well, what I, what I call on people to do is to understand Palestine um, at both a macro level and, and also a micro level. And what I mean by that on a macro level is understand it in the historical context that the Palestinians and Palestine has, has been subject to um, a European uh, settler colonialism for more uh, than 100 years right now. And Palestinians are uh, against a movement of settler colonialism for more than 100 years now. In 1948, the this settler colonial movement, the Zionist settler colonial movement, uh, it, it tried a genocide against the Palestinians. And this is very natural of settler colonial movements. Uh, settler colonialism does not see the indigenous uh, population. It does not see the native. It sees the land without uh, uh, the native. Uh, and so uh, the intention is always to remove, for that land to be empty, for the settlers to be able to be there without basically the, the, the indigenous. Um, and, and that is the case in North America, in Canada, the US, in Australia, uh, in Africa, and there are different paradigms. Paradigms that have been, uh, well, if I may say, won by the settlers, or almost won by the settlers, uh, such as North America, for example, uh, Australia as well, despite kind of the pockets of resistance that still exist today. Other paradigms that uh, the uh, native populations were able to defeat uh, settler colonialism, like, for example, in France. The situation in Palestine is still not determined, right? And this is where you know, the action of the people is most important. In 1948, there was an attempt of genocide, we call it in Nakba, where hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forcibly displaced out of their homes and thousands were massacred. Uh, but yet, the genocide was not complete. There were Palestinians who remained. They were put under military rule that was part of an apartheid system that was imposed on the Palestinian indigenous population that remained there by what uh, became the State of Israel. That's a project of the Zionist settler uh, colonial movement. And the apartheid system that was put in place, very similar to the apartheid systems that were in place in southern Africa, uh, and elsewhere, also around the world, uh, the Zionist settler, uh, the, the, the Israeli apartheid regime was based on the pillars of fragmenting the Palestinians, dispossessing the Palestinians uh, from their properties and homes and so on, segregating them and violently controlling them, uh, and depriving them of uh, a basic rights, always keeping them at a disadvantage when it comes and compared to the, then the settler society. And to maintain the system of fragmentation, segregation, dispossession, and deprivation, uh, the apartheid regime would always be committing systematic crimes of forced displacement, of unlawful killings, of arbitrary detention and torture, and uh, always denying civil and political rights so that the indigenous population may not be able to resist and challenge uh, the system of apartheid. Now, that system of apartheid that was put in place in 1948 was extended uh, to then what we know now as the West Bank and Gaza, the occupied Palestinian territories, 1967. Um, 
Palestinians have, since 1948, we may say, have always been under military occupation. Military occupation is just a tool of uh, the settler colonial regime, the, apart the settler colonial apartheid regime. Uh, in 1948, there was military rule as a tool used against the Palestinians who remained. And then, of course, in 1967, that military rule has, has been extended and put place the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, which is the case until, uh, uh, until today. Uh, and this has been the case all the way until today, where we see a genocide. And again, the settler colonial project in the regime trying to fulfill its objectives you know, that have been declared right from the given, beginning. A state only for the Jews, of course, without the indigenous population, never seeing the indigenous population, seeing the indigenous population as always and portraying it as a threat. And again, this is something that is very similar to other settler colonial regimes. In North America, in Africa, and so on, the natives were called savages. In North America, uh, the settler colonial uh, uh, powers, uh, one of the examples of the genocide there was the boarding schools, uh, where children of native communities were taken away from their families and put in school with the logo on top of the schools that said, kill the Indian, save the man, where basically the indigenous culture, the indigenous person, uh, the indigenous being was seen as a threat, not only to the political project, but here to the entirety of humanity. Of course, this humanity is perceived by European colonialists. For Palestinians, it's always been the terrorists, which is uh, until today. And, and this is a reasoning for the elimination. Now we see, again, a return to genocide and the attempt of cleansing the land of the threat, the indigenous population, the savage, and so on. And of course, you know, in launching the genocide, we've heard the Israeli Ministry of Defense say that we're fighting human animals. Um, we've heard ministers say that we're going to complete the Nakba, or we're, we're doing the Gaza Nakba. Again, Nakba is a word for, for genocide. And so on, of the many statements that were made that show the intention and also reflect the settler colonial logic that there is in, in this genocide. So this is kind of the broad kind of macro level, but also very important to understand Palestine at a micro level. And what I mean here is really understanding and connecting at a, the personal stories, you know, the individual stories of individuals, of communities, of, uh, 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 of cities, of villages, and so on. And it could be a story of, for example, the newborn babies who were left to die in the Gaza hospitals because of the genocide that is happening. You know, a, a story of like two, three days, perhaps. Or it can be a story of a grandmother who's been displaced once and twice and three times. Uh, once in the Nakba, and again from Jabalia to Gaza, and from Gaza to Rafah, and perhaps from Rafah to Egypt. So it can be these short stories, it can be these long stories. But it's very important to see and understand and hear these stories. And of course, I can tell you many, but to, my, uh, to, the, to the second section of, of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about my story here, and perhaps a little bit about kind of my generation. And I was born in, in, in the early 1980s, uh, around the same time when uh, Israel has put a siege on Beirut. Uh, it had invaded Lebanon in the fight against the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was based there. It had laid siege on Beirut, very similar to the siege that was laid on Gaza, but the Gaza one was, of course, much longer. And then the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the families there were pushed out of Beirut through the sea. And why I mention this is because we see exactly the same thing happening right now, but perhaps with a much larger uh, and a different kind of colonial violence that is happening, much more intensity, where Gaza has been under siege since 2007. Actually, we can say that Gaza has been under siege since the 1950s, but perhaps this is for another time. Um, and right now, we see the US coming to build the port in Gaza City that has been almost completely wiped out uh, in what we believe is an attempt to push Palestinians out to sea, given that Egypt has not accepted to uh, have Israel push them into, out of Gaza and into Egypt. So it has not accepted the ethnic cleansing into Egypt, so the Americans are coming in and saying, we'll build your port and you can push the Palestinians out to sea. In 1982, Tunisia accepted the Palestinians being pushed out of Beirut. Today, there is nobody that is going to accept the Palestinians being pushed out of Gaza. 
into the sea. I started school in 1987. That was the beginning of the first Intifada. And Intifada is the word we use to describe the popular grassroots uprising uh, that people in the occupied Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza started uh, to revolt against the settler colonial apartheid regime and the military occupation there. Um, and I, in, and, and, and soon after that, uh, started the so-called uh, peace process. And uh, my teenagehood was basically in the 1990s when um, we would be hearing words of peace, prosperity, development, state, liberation, uh, independence, and so on. But on the ground, we saw a proliferation of settlements, the entrenchment of the control, the system of control, of checkpoints. Um, I remember that uh, I, I used to finish school. I, I lived in Ramallah, and my family was in Jerusalem. And I remember I would finish school and, uh, and be driven, or uh, take a taxi, or take a ride to Jerusalem when I would take my karate uh, classes. The karate is very popular among Palestinians, by the way, until today. Um, and it would take me 10 minutes. Uh, and I remember, for those perhaps of you who've been to the occupied West Bank, you've seen, those who have not, maybe you've heard about the Kalandia checkpoint. This is the checkpoint that is separating Ramallah from Jerusalem. Uh, I remember when Kalandia was not there at all. Um, we could ride freely from Ramallah to Jerusalem. And I remember when then Palandia became a military jeep with the two soldiers standing outside and stopping the cars and checking them. And then there was a cement block that was added to there. So it was a military jeep and a cement block. And then there was another cement block. And year after year after year, it grew into a huge monster right now uh, that can be opened and closed at the will, of course, preventing Palestinians from traveling on this very important, crucial role, of course, that affected family life, including my family life. For example, since October, Kalandia checkpoint has been closed, and I haven't been able to see my family who's living in, in Jerusalem. I graduated from school uh, in 2021, uh, 2001, sorry, and that was the uh, beginning of the second intifada. Again, the uprising against Israel's apartheid rule and the military occupation. Um, and um, in, and, and, and I, I went to study uh, abroad and came back and, and, and started working in the occupied West Bank and of course seeing the situation uh, get worse and worse by the day. Um, I married uh, and my partner is a refugee from Yaffa. Um, her family was uh, forcibly displaced to Gaza. Uh, they are currently uh, in Jabalia, north of uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, one of the areas most hard hit by uh, the genocide. Um, and we live in a place uh, that oversees the coast. Actually, you could see Yaffa uh, from our balcony. But my wife can never go to Yaffa. Now, also important to share here, and I'll stop about the person's story and move to the other section, is that we, both of us, are classified differently by the apartheid regime. So I hold a certain legal status, she holds another legal status, which means that I can travel on certain roads that she cannot travel on. Uh, I can pass certain checkpoints that she cannot pass. Uh, I can go to Yaffa, where she's from, but she can't. Um, if we are to travel outside of the country, I would have to go through the airport, where she would have to go through Jordan, and we would meet somewhere else. Um, so, I've described all of this just to, again, to kind of go back. It's very important to understand kind of the macro, this historical and political context of the genocide that is happening right now, but also very important to kind of see it through these personal stories, the lived experiences of Palestinians. But I also talked a little bit about my experience because I wanted to come to the second part of my talk, which is that after I uh, finished my graduate studies, I started working in human rights organizations. I started first working with Human Rights Watch as a researcher in Palestine, uh, looking into human rights violations by all authorities, all what we call duty bearers, and then moved uh, to work with Amnesty International, where I spent around 11 years, and, and the last thing I did was co-author uh, the reports 
the organization's report on, um, on apartheid. And, and during these, what would come together to 14 years, uh, there, uh, looking back at it, there seems to be a, a paradox. And this paradox is as follows, that during this time, I've seen, and also other monitors, people who've been working in the human rights sector or human rights organizations, we've seen uh, more and more exposure and more and more perhaps systematic addressing of Israel's uh, systematic violation of human rights against the Palestinians. Yet at the same time, the more and more exposure there was, the more and more there's an entrenchment of the systematic violations against the Palestinians. So just to, to put it in this context, uh, I, um, when I started working with the Human Rights Watch in uh, 2008, uh, Israel launched uh, a war against Gaza, which was under a siege that was placed on it in 2007. Following that war, we've had something at the time seemed what seemed spectacular. Uh, a commission of inquiry that was set up by the Human Rights Council, uh, headed by South African jurist Richard Goldstone, producing a report that was extremely damning of Israel, documented war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, it was very well detailed, it was presented to the Human Rights Council, it had recommendations of ending impunity and accountability and so on. At the time we were celebrating this, you saw the horrors of the 2008, 2009, and then you get this report and you get the hope that maybe with this exposure, maybe with this authoritative report that we'll start seeing a, a change here. But nothing happened. In 2012, Israel again launched an attack against Gaza. It was shorter than 2000. And, eight one. and again, after the 2012 attack, there was another commission of inquiry, there was condemnation, there was exposure of the violations that were taking place. Nothing happens. In 2014, Israel launches what was, at the time, the most horrific attack on Gaza, which now is under seven years of siege. And that war in 2014 was known, among other things, uh, of the policy uh, of targeting uh, families while they were in their homes. And I remember because I was documented, I was, preventing, pre I was prevented from entering uh, Gaza at the time. I was working with Amnesty, along with other human rights researchers. We were not allowed by Israel, neither Egypt, uh, to enter and do that documentation on the ground. And so we were relying on colleagues who were working under the bombardment and other risks to collect information and pass it on to us we were where we would report on it. It, it, was, it was one of the scariest and darkest of, of times uh, doing uh, human rights documentation. Um, uh, <clears throat> but I remember it was Ramadan, very similar to today. And I remember families, you know, the pictures of uh, uh, the iftar, uh, basically, as is one picture in particular of a family in Khan Yunis who had just prepared the iftar to sit down and eat, and the entire home was bombed. They were eating outside. It was, uh, it was summertime, and it's the rubble on top of kind of the food, but the entire family of 20-something people were entirely wiped out. Um, and that was systematic. It's just not, it was not just one case. It was case after case after case. And after the 2014 war, we get, well, actually two things. One, a commission of inquiry, also by the United Nations, set up by the Human Rights Council, but something that at the time also saw, we saw as very significant. That Palestine, that was recognized as an observer state in 2012 at the UN, <clears throat> was able to join then international treaties and convention, and in 2014, following the war, signed the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, allowing the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over the occupied Palestinian territories. So now, this World Court can investigate the war crimes and crimes against humanity that were taking place or had taken place in the 2014 war. And there was perhaps a glimpse of hope that we felt. This was quite significant. Now, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court can investigate and can issue arrest warrants and this, these actually were questions that were asked. I was still uh, investigating and reporting on the 2014 war, collecting information, speaking to victims and witnesses on the phone. 
And I remember getting asked the question by the people I would be interviewing about the ICC. You know, does this really make a difference? Is this new right now? Will we see you know, an arrest warrant issued against Israeli uh, war criminals? Will we see them arrested? Will I see my home uh, 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 rebuilt again? You know, is there going to be accountability? So you could feel a little, bit, a little bit of hope there that maybe there'll be accountability. At least there'll be deterrence, we thought that now with uh, what was at the time a preliminary investigation by, by the ICC, that this would deter Israelis, at least it perhaps would deter the soldiers carrying out the orders of bombing homes and schools and infrastructure to think twice before, for example, following the order that they've got from, from their commanders. But four years later, we get 2018, Palestinians in Gaza, majority of whom are refugees, been displaced from their homes in 1948. And again, you know, just linking back to the kind of the macro picture that I drew at, at the beginning, I organized what was called the Great March of Return demonstrations. And they went to the separation barrier, calling for their right to return, enshrined in international law, and for the lifting of the criminal siege that was imposed on them, preventing you know, essentials of life and so on. And the response from Israel to these demonstrations was to put snipers, actually they established structures including earth mounds, where snipers were there and have shot and killed, massacred people in their hundreds and injured people in their thousands. And I remember, you know, and I was again kind of covering uh, uh, that, that massacre um, I remember one of my colleagues uh, 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 telling me uh, something that is kind of qu quite disturbing to this, well, it was quite disturbing to hear and it's quite disturbing to say. And, you know, we were talking about the number, the massive number of injuries, and all the injuries were by snipers, and the vast majority of them were basically shot in the knee, or in the knees, whereby there'll be, you know, uh, a, a cutting of the legs, right? And, and, and she was telling me, you know, trying to understand the logic of this. And she was saying that, you know, when you kill one person, you just take that one person away from the family or the community. But if you injure one person, you have paralyzed the entire community. So it's not just one person that you're taking away, it's actually four people that you're taking away. With every person, there are at least two to three people that you have taken away because they have to care for them, they'll have to work instead of them. And most of the injured were young men, the breadwinners, uh, of, of their families. After the 2018 report, again, uh, after the 2018 massacre, again, uh, another exposure, reports by human rights organizations, massive exposure uh, of what had happened at the time. Um, and again, nothing happened. Impunity is still in place. Israel is, is still able to continue on with its practices. Um, and in 2020, we get an, again something that is very significant. Uh, well, actually two things that were very significant. One, that the preliminary investigation by the ICC has become an official investigation. So after this preliminary investigation by the, by, by the prosecutor, the prosecutor decides that there is sufficient basis to open an official investigation into the situation where the court now has jurisdiction and it does so in 2020. At the same time also, after massive push by Palestinian civil society, including the BDS and others, the Human Rights Council publishes a database of companies that are complicit in illegal Israeli settlements, which according to international law are war crimes, which is something kind of a massive achievement at the time. And again, you get this feeling that, all oh, right, maybe something will happen, maybe something, you know, is gonna change right now. Maybe we'll see a bit of accountability. Right now we're focusing on corporations, not Israel. Maybe they'll be deterred. Maybe they'll pull out from settlements, but yet nothing, nothing has happened. 2021, 2022 have been in the West Bank and also Gaza. There've been a couple of military attacks by Israel against Gaza in these two years. have been the bloodiest at least in, in the West Bank. Uh, at the time, I remember in 2021, one of the organizations, Defense for Children International, is called 2021, the bloodiest year for children 
uh, in like 10, 15 years at the time. Don't quote me on this, but you can check DCI uh, Palestine for the exact quotes. And after this, we get something again that is very significant. The Human Rights Council sets up a commission of inquiry headed by South African jurist Nabi Pele, uh, who was also High Commissioner for Human Rights for a long time. But this time, this commission of inquiry has an unprecedented mandate in terms of geography and time, meaning that for the first time, we have a commission of inquiry by the UN that is now looking not only at occupied Palestinian territories, but also at Israel. And we have a commission of inquiry not bound by time, meaning it's not just for one year or two years or looking at a specific period of time. It is an evergreen commission of inquiry. And instituted in the mandate of that inquiry is also a mechanism that it can deliver evidence directly to the office of the prosecutor of the ICC. So again, what I'm trying to put at, you know, point at is this continuous kind of systematic exposure and also addressing, including in the creation of mechanisms to address Israel's systematic human rights violations, and nothing is happening. Quite the contrary. Things are getting worse and worse by the day. In 2022, <coughs> around the same time, we see the major human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, also Israeli human rights organizations, B'Tselem, come out and say that Israel is imposing a system of Jewish supremacy, of apartheid, uh, from the river to the sea against the Palestinians. Also unprecedented. Nobody had thought that these human rights organizations would be able to come to these kind of conclusions. Uh, Palestinians would be thrown out of rooms. You know, a few years before that, Palestinians would be thrown out of rooms if they mentioned the word apartheid. You know, doors would be closed on them. And now you have Amnesty and Human Rights Watch come out and, you know, say the sacred word, you know, say the Tubu word, but not only say it, actually provide reports that are very well documented hard evidence and solid legal analysis of how Israel is imposing a system of apartheid that is also amounts to a crime against humanity. And here we are, we have now the crime of crimes, genocide being perpetrated against 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza. And so what I was trying to say, kind of like show you this parallel line where one you have this kind of systematic engagement and exposure by the UN, human rights organizations, and so on of these violations, yet at the same time, things continuously getting worse. And I said it seems like a paradox, but actually it's not. It's not a paradox at all. And the reason why we see, we see this happening is because there is complicity. Complicity by states, complicity by organizations, by institutions, by the academia, by cultural organizations, in Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people. And that doesn't make it a, a paradox at all. As long as you have states, and particularly in the global north, in the west, that are actively supporting, that are actively engaged in these crimes, that there is, you know, nothing is gonna happen. The situation is gonna, for the Palestinians, not only remain the same, but deteriorate. This is part of the reason then why I moved to uh, from Amnesty International, I left the organization in 2022 after I published the report. Um, and particularly seeing that, you know, while the report is, is fantastic, it's very well documented, it provides solid legal analysis, it was not able to, Amnesty International was not able to see how it takes that report forward in a way that it would actually be able to dismantle Israel's settler colonial uh, apartheid regime. Because in the recommendations page, for example, in the report, it was all recommendations to Israel to reform itself. You know, fix this law, rescind this law, drop this policy, adopt that policy. And again, speaking to Israel as a, as a state that is respectful of law, that abides by the rule of law, that is bound by the rule of law, and will actually respond to these recommendations. Um, and actually here, I'll, I'll I'll mention quickly one of the reasons that uh, Amnesty started working on, 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 on apartheid in this way was in 2014, uh, and, and, you know, I was in the organization at that time, um, I, I did a report on a, a pattern of unlawful killings uh, by Israeli forces uh, against Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, including children. Um, and at the time, there was a spike in those, in those uh, uh, killings. And one of the 
a, a villages where we've done a lot of documentation was the village of Nabi Saleh. Uh, and Nabi Saleh is a village just outside of Ramallah, very small, about 500 to like 600 people who live there, most of them from a Tamimi family. And in 2009, the nearby illegal settlement of Halamish has taken over their water spring. And so they started organizing weekly protests whereby they would, every Friday, try to reach the water spring to reclaim it. And they would be met with brutal force. Brutal force that has led to many injuries, killings, but also collective punishment. The puncturing of water tanks, the firing of tear gas into homes, and so on. And so we've done a documentation of an you know, there's a following of the Nabi Saleh. And then after the publishing of the report, that was before the war, I take the report along with colleagues, and we go to the village of Nabi Saleh to kind of present the report. You know, we're giving them to show them, you know, the work that we've done, and we were welcomed. Um, you know, thank you very much, this is great, and so on. One of the activists who's currently in, in Israeli prison, his name is Basim Tamimi. Uh, his daughter, uh, Ahdi Tamimi, was also in prison some time ago, and again this time since October 7th, um, he, uh, again, you know, in a very kind of nice way, says, thank you very much for this, this is great, um, and opens the recommendations page of the report and says, you know, what I see you, thanks again, you know, for the report, it's great for the documentation, but, you know, what I see you doing here is telling the occupation how to kill us better. Um, and what he meant by this is, that in the recommendations page that would basically guide the organization in the action it would take, uh, it's all about the reform of Israeli policy. You know, you have to, your uh, open fire regulations have to be better on this front. You know, when you fire, for example, a tear gas, you have to fire from this distance. When you fire a, you know, a rubber-coated metal bullet, it has to be, you know, bouncing off the ground, for example. Um, uh, you cannot use live fire in these instances, but perhaps you can use them. You know, it's all like, re you know, recommendations to reform. And what he was saying, that this, this is just, you know, telling them how, how to kill us better. But what we need is something that would uproot this systematic violation, this apartheid system uh, 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 that, 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 is, that is imposed. And that, that was an awakening call. It was, it was very important to hear it from that activist. And actually, the organization, to the credit, you know, took it home. And that was one of the most important stories for why the apartheid report, that Amnesty's apartheid report started. But it speaks to kind of, you know, what, what, needs, what needs to be done. And, and, and without addressing the complicity, there's, you know, we'll not be able to see the change, uh, the betterment of the human rights situation, the betterment of Palestinians, the Palestinian realization of freedom, justice, and dignity uh, uh, that, that we are, the Palestinians are call, we are calling for and uh, others are supporting us in calling for. And this is why BDS, because BDS targets that complicity that allows Israel uh, to continue entrenching a settler colonial system of apartheid and systematic human rights violations against Israel. It addresses that complicity of states, institutions, corporations, cultural organizations. And very quickly, perhaps most of you know here, but the BDS movement uh, came after a call from Palestinian civil society in 2005 to boycott Israel, divest from Israel and impose sanctions against Israel uh, until it respects international law, until there's a realization of uh, Palestinian right of self-determination, Palestinian right of return, and the Palestinian right to equality, until the settler colonial apartheid regime and military occupation is, is dismantled. And one of the most significant achievements of the BDS movement since then has been uh, on this course particularly this, the framing that I was talking about at the beginning, is understanding the situation for the reality it is of settler colonial apartheid. It was pioneering, actually, at the time of introducing and mainstreaming and globalizing uh, Israeli apartheid all around the world. And, you know, here, five, okay, I'll, I'll try to wrap up very quickly. Um, I wanna, because sometimes, you know, we, we say the BDS movement and also, um, uh, we, um, we say the BNC, and I, I, th I thought just I'll take a minute to kind of explain uh, what is uh, the BNC. And the BNC, uh, Palestinian BDS National Committee, 
It was the body that was formed after the 2005 call to uh, set the campaigns, the policies, and provide the leadership and the guidance for what has become a massive global nonviolent movement around the world. And the BNC is the largest coalition in Palestinian society. And I thought this is very important to share here. Um, and allow me just to kind of reflect when I say the largest coalition, what we mean by the largest coalition. I'm just going to read the list of the members of the BNC uh, that include the Council of National Islamic Forces, uh, of National Islamic Forces in Palestine, General Union of Palestinian Workers, Palestinian Union of Postal IT and Telecommunications Workers, Palestinian Trade Union Coalition for BDS, Palestinian NGO Network, Palestinian National Institute for NGOs, Federation of Independent Trade Unions, Global Palestine Right of Return Coalition, Palestinian Bar Association, Palestinian Medical Association, General Union of Palestinian Teachers, Palestinian Federation of Unions, of University Professors and Employees, General Union of Palestinian Women, Union of Palestinian Writers, Palestinian Farmers, Peasants, and the list goes on. I'm not going to read it all. Actually, it's just going to take a long time. Uh, but why I'm doing this is just to reflect that, you know, when we say there's the leadership, this is where the policies and the campaigns come from. They come from that popular base, that mass representation. These organizations have constituents in the tens of thousands of people, and it's the largest coalition. The theory of change of BDS is that, you know, put very simply, that through the building of people power at a grassroots level in an intersectional way through coalition, that we can force the change that we want to see. We want to see. Uh, that it is only people that are able to create the change that we want. We're not going to wait for a government to change policy on Palestine. We're not going to wait for politicians to change policy on Palestine. We'll only be able to do that through the popular mobilization and the building of, of people power. And right now, what we need at the time of genocide are two things to be happening at the same time. One is the disruption of business as usual is to send a very clear and active real message to companies, states, and so on, that it, you will not be allowed to carry business as usual with Israel while it carries out genocide, and that can happen through the different actions that we've been seeing all across here, the country and island, where there is, by the way, a high level of complicity. Maybe we'll come to that in, 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 the, in the questions or, or the discussion, if, if we still have time. And the other thing is really the pushing for policy change, is the ending of what I may call kind of seasonal solidarity with Palestine. When the war was happening in 2014, and this is why I mentioned it, we've seen massive solidarity, mass protests where they are here in, in Ireland, in UK, in Malaysia, in Australia, in Chile, you know, perhaps as big as, as the ones that we're seeing. Uh, there were BDS groups also that have spread and solidarity groups all around. Uh, we've had, as the BDS movement, many achievements around that time as well. You know, we have colleagues here that perhaps would you know, be able to talk about it. But we're back to a worse situation right now, and that's because we were not able to institutionalize the change, to effect policy change, whereby you know, not only the complicity is ended, but that it is not allowed to happen ever again. That an apartheid regime is not allowed a lifeline. It's isolated, it's weakened until it is uh, eventually uh, uh, dismantled. Right now, I was, I was just going to say a point about the ICJ, but perhaps we can come back to it later because, you know, despite uh, uh, all of what I described, international law altogether is right now uh, at, at, at risk, but we do have an opportunity, particularly for BDS, uh, because of the case that was brought by South Africa, the country that has liberated itself from uh, apartheid against Israel under the Genocide Convention, and a ruling that confirms the plausibility of genocide. This provides us with a tool, with the power to be able to confront at a policy uh, a change level. And to end um, is, <clears throat> you know, I've, st I've, started, I've started with the genocide and trying to understand that. And what I would like to end with is, is, uh, is to say that Gaza is a, is a front, is a global front, is a global front from humanity. Because if Israel gets away Israel supported by the US, UK, and Germany. If they get away with the genocide in Gaza, that means we have entered a world where this facade of international law has completely fallen. 
it's free for all, it's might makes right, and it's according to the UN Secretary General, an age of chaos, where if you dare to challenge Western domination or hegemony, you will be wiped out and nobody is gonna say anything about it. So Gaza is a front here, and this is why not only it's important to fight for the Palestinians there, to stop the genocide and so on, the, legal, the, the implications of what is happening in Gaza are global, are severe, and very dangerous. And I usually end on a positive note, but I forgot this, so, but thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.